Hi everyone, thank you for joining. Today we'll be escaping virtualized containers. I'm Yuval Avrami, I'm a security researcher at Palo Alto Networks, and me and my team's main focus is cloud security and container security. And today I'm going to walk you through a research I conducted on Kata containers, which is a sandboxing solution for containers that runs virtualized containers. It runs each container inside the virtual machine. And today we'll be trying to escape that sandbox and hopefully uh, through that, learn a bit about uh, container security. So a bit about the, the agenda for today. We'll start off by talking about uh, container and container security in general. Uh, and then we'll talk about Kata containers, a sandboxing solution, like I've said. Uh, why is that needed and how is it implemented? And uh, then we'll try to escape the sandbox. So we first need to uh, break out of the container and then escape the virtual machine. So we have uh, quite a bit of challenges ahead. And then we'll wrap it up with some uh, takeaways from the research. So let's start with containers. Uh, there's a misconception uh, that containers are just lightweight VMs. That's not the case. Truth on steroids is actually a better uh, description if you're uh, familiar with uh, Linux. But uh, when I wanted to really sum up containers uh, in one sentence, what I came up with is uh, restricted processes running in a separate file system. And the key word here is processes. At the end, containers are just Linux processes running with a couple of uh, isolation primitives applied to them. And you probably heard about uh, some of those uh, isolation, uh, as isolation primitives. Uh, so for example, namespaces uh, define what a process or what a container can see. So the PID namespace will define what other processes uh, may a container see. Uh, then you have pr primitives which are more related to what a container can do, uh, like capabilities in a secomp. So for example, uh, capabilities are, bas are basically privileges in Linux. Uh, so you wouldn't like the container to have the uh, sys reboot capability, as that would allow him to shut down the machine. And of course, that's something you don't want the uh, container to be able to do. Uh, finally, the, the final piece that really ties it all together are uh, control groups or C groups, uh, which are all about resource isolation and limiting uh, the container's access to host resources. Uh, for example, you wouldn't like the container to be able to uh, exhaust the, the entire host memory um, and launch a denial of service attack against the host, right? And all of those together give, uh, allow us to uh, separate a process enough from the system for it to be considered a, a container. But you still can't really compare the type of isolation uh, provided by those primitives and the isolation of containers uh, to the level of isolation provided by virtual machines. And, and the main uh, difference is, is that uh, virtual machines run with a, uh, on a separate kernel uh, from, the, from the host and containers uh, share the host kernel. Um, and that's really a fancy way of saying that containers are, at the end are just processes. And like any process, they interact with the uh, kernel uh, quite frequent, frequently, uh, either uh, when they invoke system call or if a page fault happen, uh, <coughs> happens in their context. And that means that uh, like other processes on the, on the machine, and the kernel is quite a large of an attack surface for containers to try and exploit uh, to gain a foothold and a control over the entire host, right? And uh, the, the issue here is that those vulnerabilities don't really have to be related to uh, namespaces or to C groups or to any of the primitives that really make up containers. Uh, just any uh, privilege escalation vulnerability in the kernel, in, the, in a code path in the kernel that the, the container can somehow uh, invoke uh, could allow a container to uh, break out. And that's quite concerning uh, in a lot of scenarios. And uh, to tackle that, that issue, a few a solution around, a few uh, tools arrives that uh, allow you to sandbox container. And Kata containers is one of the uh, first solution uh, to actually try to do that. And it takes a, a pretty straightforward approach at the sandbox in the containers. It just runs each container inside the dedicated lightweight virtual machine. And by doing that, you get two layers of isolation, right? You get first the container and then the virtual machine. And you also mitigated the uh, breakouts which are based on kernel vulnerabilities, uh, because even if the container exploits a vulnerability in the guest kernel, he's only compromising the guest, right? He still doesn't have access to the host. And really the idea of Kata is to provide a simple way uh, to sandbox containers where you can just plug Kata uh, into existing uh, solutions like Docker and Kubernetes and have uh, certain containers run with an additional uh, layer of isolation. So what's, what's the use case uh, for this type of solution? So first, as I've said, uh, Kata is great for uh, untrusted or targeted containers where you 
you're afraid the container might want to uh, break out and affect the host. And it's also uh, really useful in multi-tenant environments where you want to uh, segregate a container from uh, uh, several tenants. And there are a lot of scenarios where you, those use cases uh, are useful. Uh, but cloud service provider is, is one of the prominent ones because uh, that's, those two uh, use cases are really the problem that cloud service providers have, right? They run uh, containers from multiple customers on the same platforms. And those containers might be malicious. They, they, really, don't they, they really don't know. Uh, they need a, uh, and they need a solution to create a strong isolation boundary between containers of different customers, right? And Kata really fits that scenario uh, uh, great. And several cloud service providers are already using Kata in production uh, to support customer multi-tenancy. So how do you really uh, use Kata? Um, so in a normal container setup, you have the container engine, so something like Docker, and you also have the container runtime. And that's because container engines don't really know how to run containers. And when they actually need to, uh, they defer to their defined runtime. And that runtime actually knows how to set up the container. So normally, you would use the run C, which is the default uh, in industry standard runtime. But you can decide that you, if you have an untrusted container with, where you want to sandbox that container, you can just define Kata as the underlying runtime of your container engine, say, say Docker. And now, uh, when you run that container with Kata, it will be uh, deployed inside the virtual machine with an additional layer of isolation. So uh, we, we, at the end of the day, want to break out of this, uh, of this sandbox. So let's see a bit more in depth how does that work. So that's, how you, uh, that's the command to uh, start a container under Docker with Kata. And uh, the way this works is Docker will tell uh, the Kata runtime on the host, uh, please set up a container for me. And the Kata runtime now needs to set up a virtual machine. So it will defer to one of the free defined uh, virtual machine monitors. Uh, virtual machine monitors are basically software that knows how to set up virtual machines. And those are either a QMU, a cloud hypervisor by Intel, or Firecracker by Amazon. And it will use one of those to set up the virtual machine. Next, it will also set up a shared directory uh, between the host and the guest virtual machine to deliver some files for the, for, to the guest. Uh, for example, uh, in order to deploy the container, the guest must have the uh, container image, right? And, and now, once that done, a process called the Kata agent uh, will start running uh, in the guest, and he is responsible for actually uh, deploying uh, the container inside the guest. So it will take the container configuration from the Kata runtime and also the image from the shared directory and use those two to actually deploy the container. And uh, there you have it at the end, you have a container running inside a lightweight virtual machine, what you expected, and you get uh, two layers of isolation. So now that we know how things work, let's try to escape the sandbox. And uh, why would you like to do that? Well, first, it's fun and it's challenging, right? You have two isolation layers to break out of. And second, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to learn about container security. So what's our attack scenario? So enterprises use Kata to contain untrusted and targeted containers. We're that untrusted container trying to break out and affect the host. Cloud service providers uh, use Kata to uh, support customer multi-tenancy. So we're that evil customer uploading our malicious containers and trying to break out and affect the entire platform and affect other customers. So as, that, as a malicious container, what's the plan? It's pretty straightforward. We first need to escape the container and then uh, break out of the virtual machine. So we'll get to that in a second, but I want to uh, discuss scope for a bit. Uh, Kata is very configurable. Uh, the vulnerabilities I'll show here won't work in every configuration, but we'll be, be targeting uh, the standard default configuration that Kata ships with. Uh, also, we'll be focusing on, on a simple container guest, on a single container guest under Docker. Uh, with Kubernetes, you could have uh, multiple containers uh, in one guest, which uh, some exploitation gets complex because of that. And uh, in one of the attacks I'm going to show, I'm still, I still need to uh, win a race condition for that to work under Kubernetes. So we'll keep it simple. We'll, we'll focus on a single container guest under Docker. And finally, I want to say this is not an indictment against Kata. You know, every software will have uh, its share of vulnerabilities. I really want to show it uh, just to, so you could uh, learn about container security. So our first job of the day, as I've said, is to escape the container, right? So we could rely on a vulnerability in the guest kernel, right? And, and, and on a privilege escalation vulnerability in the guest kernel. But that really misses the point, right? We want to learn about container security. We want to find an issue that is related 
two containers. So we want to find an, a native issue with how Kata sets up the container inside the guest virtual machine. So in order to do that, we need to talk about how do those issues even look like? You know, how do you approach the, the task of uh, looking at the container runtime and trying to break it? So let's look again at the a setup of a containerized environment. So you have the engine, which as I've said, like, like Docker, which as I've said, doesn't really know how to set up containers. And you have the runtime, which really knows how to uh, take a configuration and set up a container. So the engine responsibility here is to uh, generate a secure configuration. It will tell the runtime what restrictions to set up, so uh, which namespaces and which uh, capabilities and so on. And the runtime will take that configuration and apply it uh, uh, to create a container. Now, when you're talking about how do you uh, escape containers, you're really talking about what issues uh, could be in this, in this process. So the first type of issue that could, uh, to, that could arise in this process is in the initialization of, a, of the containerized process. Uh, you have a host process, the runtime, trying to use untrusted variables like, like the container image and the command and to set up a containerized process. That process is really, uh, that, that uh, procedure is really uh, complicated and, and crucial and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, issues was found in that process. Uh, for example, uh, there was an issue with the runtime exposing, a, a briefly exposing host file descriptors to the container, which the container could have used to break out. And that issue really is a runtime issue because uh, the runtime is the one in charge of setting up the container, right? And the second type of issue uh, is really an engine issue where you, uh, at the end, you, you finish the initialization of the container and now you have a running container with a couple of restrictions applied to it. But uh, there could be a scenario where, where that container is simply not restricted enough, right? And that really sh uh, points to a, a problem with the uh, container configuration and the restrictions supplied by the engine. And because of that, that's an issue with the engine. And it really, uh, it's, it points to permissive engine defaults or perhaps to a new breakout techniques that, that wasn't discovered before. And normally those are the two areas where you will hunt for uh, issues and vulnerabilities in. But uh, when I came to look at Kata, I noticed that it's quite a unique case uh, because Kata is a runtime that actually uh, modifies the configuration uh, received from the engine. And the reason it does it, it is because it turns out that a configuration generated on the host need to be adjusted in order to be uh, valid, uh, valid for use to deploy a container inside a, a different machine, inside a virtual machine, which has a, a different kernel, a different uh, set of emulated hardware, and so on. But uh, that's really dangerous to do because container engines over uh, years of uh, vulnerabilities have learned how to create a, a restricted enough configuration that isn't breakable. So for us, if we want to escape, we can take a look at what Kata does and perhaps find issue with how it modifies the configuration. And Kata does a couple of things, but the main things I want to focus on is that it discards uh, several C groups, several control groups, C groups. And C groups are tied, as I've said, uh, to hardware resources. And because the uh, host and the guest have a different set of hardware resources, right? The guest have an emulated set, a virtualized set of hardware resources. Uh, some C groups just don't make sense uh, in the guest if you generate them on the host. So uh, uh, for example, a device C group, uh, the host and the guest have different devices. And you might think it's a bit uh, extreme to just discard several, several C groups. But if, you, if I wanted to understand the reasoning behind it, I think, I think the reasoning is that C groups are known to be mainly about denying denial of service attacks, preventing denial of service attack from the container to the underlying machine. But because here the container runs inside the guest virtual machine, it's no problem really if the container launches a denial of service attack against the guest, right? It's, to, it's, not, it's only hurting itself, only attacking his own sandbox. He's not any closer to uh, gain in code execution on the host. But the thing is, uh, C groups are mainly about preventing an error of service, uh, but uh, some people forget that uh, they're not only about that. And one, device, one C group that is actually quite interesting, uh, which Kata doesn't enforce, is the device C group. And let's have a look at what the device C group does. So the device C group uh, restricts uh, the container access to system devices, quite simply. And Kata doesn't enforce that C groups, as I've said, meaning that we inside the container have more access than usual to the devices of the underlying system. 
And when you look, and that system is the guest virtual machine. And when you look at those devices and think what device could be uh, interesting to us from the container, well, the guest hard disk is quite interesting, right? We in the container have a, a view of only a, a specific file system, the container file system. But if we gain access to the entire guest hard disk, we can now uh, um, possibly manipulate it in order to gain code execution on the host, right? So uh, how do you even access a hard disk? in Linux, and those uh, type of devices are called block devices. Well, uh, you first need a way to refer to that uh, hard disk, to that device. And in Linux, everything is a file, so of course, you create a, a device file that refers to that block device or to that hard disk. In Linux, every device is identified by two numbers. You can see in the examples, uh, in the example uh, here, those are eight and one. So you first use make node, uh, to create the device file, uh, referring to that device, and then you mount the device file over some directory uh, in your system, and now when you interact with the files under the, the directory, you're actually interacting with the hard disk, right? Everything you do in the directory is uh, propagated back to the hard disk, and that's really the, the easy way to interact with the file system. Uh, but uh, we, that's actually not very useful for us in the container, because uh, the when the container, we have the make node capability, which is required to, uh, to create the device file, but we don't have the sysadmin capability, uh, which from the name you, you, you may realize that it's good, the containers don't have the sysadmin capability, but because we don't have that capability, we can't mount. And below you can see a, a, kata, a kata container running under Docker, which, tries to, which can create the device file for the guest hard disk, but it can mount it, so it seems like uh, we're in a bit of a problem, even though we should have more access to the devices, uh, other uh, restrictions are still stopping us. But there is actually another way uh, to access uh, devices in Linux, and that's by directly reading and writing to the device file, so you don't even need to mount them. And why, why is that useful? Uh, for example, if the hard disk have a corrupted file system and you are not able to mount it correctly, you might need some uh, direct access to the device to try to fix things. So there are actually uh, uh, build tools like DebugFS, which you, we can use inside the container to directly interact with the hard disk without needing to mount it. And you can see in the example there that we can see the files on the hard disk and we have a great indication that that's really the guest hard disk because when, when we inspect the binaries in it, we can see the kata agent which we expect to run to be uh, present on the guest. And it's not only reading access to the hard disk, it's only also writing access. So because we don't have device group, we can actually modify the guest hard disk from within the container. So, does that mean we broke out? Can we now just easily execute code on the guest? Well, it turns out that it's not so easy, and there are two mechanisms in a way, uh, the page cache and the, the entry cache. And because of those, uh, changes that we make at the device level may not really be apparent to a uh, processes running on the guest. So why is that? In Linux, when, you, when a, a process interacts with a file, Linux will read that uh, by reading it, executing it, or, or whatever, Linux will read that file from the hard disk, right? But that's an expensive operation. So uh, it will also keep a, a cache of that file content in the page cache. So uh, the next time a process access that file, then Linux doesn't have to go all the way to the hard disk and can simply access the page cache. That's great for performance, but it's pretty bad for us because we're in the container and we are directly writing to the hard disk. So if we're in the container, for example, and we uh, modify uh, SH on the hard disk, and then some process on the guest tries to access SH, if SH is already in the page cache, uh, that process will see the original version of the SH from the page, page cache and not our malicious version on the hard disk. And that's not good for us if we want to gain code execution on the guest. To make things work, uh, the guest is pretty static. And beside the kata agent and systemd, uh, nothing really else really runs on it, and it doesn't really invoke and interact with files. So it's even harder for us to gain code execution. So how do we deal with that problem? So as I've said, the guest is static. So and we can't expect it to just run a, a new executable, so we need to replace an already running executable. So that's either the kata agent or systemd, but those, as I've said, are already loaded to the page cache. So uh, in order for us uh, to, uh, in, in order for the uh, for modification that we make to the hard disk to actually be apparent to guest processes, we need to some way to force the guest kernel to free the page cache. 
And how can we do it? Well, uh, the page cache uh, uses memory that is currently unused. But if a process wants that memory, the kernel will give the process that memory because it will say, okay, uh, later on I, I can just read it again from the hard disk. Um, and right now that, that memory is, used, is uh, necessary by a process. So when the container can allocate small chunks of memory to uh, uh, slowly chip away at the, at the page cache and the files in it until we can actually uh, successfully clear Kata agent from the page cache. And now uh, when something access the, the Kata agent binary, it will must go to the hard disk. So if it's still uh, not completely clear, I'll try to uh, explain it by showing the, how the attack will work. So the attack, uh, uh, the scenario is that we are in a malicious container, right? And we want to gain code execution on the guest. So what we do, we first override the Kata agent binary on the hard disk. But nothing really, really happens because the Kata agent process, the memory is mapped to the uh, version in the page cache, which isn't malicious. So in order for our version to be propagated to the, guest, to the process, we, need, we, mal we allocate small chunks of memory in order to clear the Kata agent from the page cache. And now, when the execution passes back to the Kata agent process, the kernel realizes, okay, wait, I need to uh, get the version, I need to get Kata agent from the hard disk again. And now when it does it, it fetches the malicious version that we've put in, we, we've put in the hard disk. So, uh, and now uh, the Kata agent process maps to our malicious version, and it runs the code that we wrote to the guest hard disk. So we, it seems like we can get a uh, guest code execution. But uh, the truth is it's, it's not really that easy uh, because replacing a process, re replacing the binary that the process is running uh, uh, while it is running, it's quite tricky because you can imagine that uh, the, pro the cut agent process is now running a specific op code in a specific function. And now when we replace the executable that it is running, we don't know when that switch will happen. So we don't know where in the new binary, uh, where it will land, which opcode it will now execute in the new binary. So it's really hard to get a stable code execution using that. And m the most likely thing that will happen is that the cut agent process will just crash. So that's not good for us. We want stable code execution. So instead of the of the cut agent process crashing being a bug of our exploit, we actually make it a feature of our, of our exploit, and we intentionally uh, crash the Kata agent binary. So how do we do it? We intentionally override the Kata agent binary on hard disk with garbage data. But we also override another binary, uh, systemd shutdown, with the actual malicious code that we want to run on the guest. And then we follow the same procedure as before. We allocate small chunks of memory to clear the Kata agent from the page cache. And now ex when execution passes back to the Kata agent process on the guest, it, the kernel must read uh, the garbage Kata uh, agent version from the disk, from the hard disk. And the uh, Kata agent process now maps to the version. Its memory now maps to the version. And it, of course, crashes, right? Because it now maps to garbage data. But now, once the Kata agent process crashes, a, a, a systemd shutdown sequence is, in, is started, which eventually, as you might have guessed, calls the shutdown binary. Now, the shutdown binary was never executed before. It is only uh, accessed uh, when you want to shut down the machine. And therefore, it is not in the page cache and will need to be uh, directly read from the disk. So uh, now, uh, the malicious version that of the shutdown binary that we've put in the hard disk will start executing on the guest, and it starts executing from the, uh, like a normal process, and not uh, a switch in the middle of execution, so that we can actually get stable code execution by doing that. So let's see a demo of how does that work. Uh, and the demo, the malicious, uh, the malicious shutdown binary will simply create a file in the shared directory, uh, which is supposed to be only accessible from the guest and not from inside the container. And just and we it just creates that file so we can see that the, the exploit works. So let's see the exploit in action. So I'm going to show you the code of the shutdown binary that I'm going to write run on the guest. Uh, and the code is quite simple. As I've said, it just creates a, a, a binary in the shared a file in the shared directory called guest is now malicious. So it's quite simple. And then it sleeps so we can see inspect the shared directory. So we are now running the exploit with Docker under Kata. And the thing, first thing the exploit does is tell us, uh, this is my container ID. So that's where the shared directory on the host side should be. And we can see that the shared directory has the normal contents. Everything is okay. 
but now when the container continues, uh, it uh, gets created device file for the guest hard disk, and it replaces the shutdown binary with the code that I've showed you, and also swaps the kata agent binary on the guest hard disk uh, with garbage data. Nothing really happens now, right? Because the kata agent is still in the page cache, but when we allocate uh, uh, enough memory, we will actually crush the kata agent, causing our shutdown process to start running, and we can now see that it indeed it ran on the guest, and it created the file that we expected. So that's great. And we got a way uh, to break out of the container and execute code on the guest, a breakout technique that exploits a direct device access, that exploits the lack of C groups. And it really shows you that if you mess around and modify a container's configuration, you better be only adding restrictions. You, 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 you don't really know what uh, other uh, effects removing that uh, might happen if you remove a, a certain restriction. Uh, researchers might find a way to exploit that to break out. Now, the container does need the make note capability in order to uh, exploit this issue, uh, but that's default in most places, and of course, this issue received the CV. So the next thing that we want to do is to escape the virtual machine, and that will actually be a bit easier. So let's talk about the attack surface of the virtual machine. So uh, first of all, uh, the kata runtime is a process running on the host, and it parses messages from the kata agent. So if there's a vulnerability in the kata runtime, the kata, a malicious kata agent might be able to exploit that and gain code execution. But kata runtime is written in Golang, which is memory safe, and none of those messages really are that interesting. So that's really not relevant. Uh, another thing that could happen is the issue with the vulnerability in the virtual machine monitor, right? Which is actually the boundary between the uh, guest virtual machine and the host. But we'll uh, not talk about that for, 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 for now. Uh, what I really want to talk about is the shared directory uh, between the host and the guest, because it's quite an interesting of an attack surface. Um, the kata runtime on the host side uh, operates on the files in the shared directory, but the guest can control those files just as much as the host, right? It's a shared directory, meaning that uh, we are in, the get, in, the get, in, in a malicious guest, we can manipulate the file in the shared directory in order to maybe affect the kata runtime running on the host as root to do some things that it doesn't expect. And one of the most interesting things that's done with the shared directory is that it is used to deliver the image to the guest. So let's see how does that work. So uh, when, you when the guest virtual machine is started, Kata Runtime bind mounts the container image to the shared directory. Then the container starts running inside the guest. At some point, it terminates inside the guest. And then the Kata Runtime unmounts the container image from the shared directory. So that seems quite reasonable, right? But the problem here is that both mount and unmount operations follow symlinks. So in the guest, meaning that a malicious guest could uh, place symlinks inside the shared directory and cause the uh, kata runtime to uh, target other things on the host uh, that are not in the shared directory. So it's really easier to see it uh, in action. So let's start actually with the unmount redirection because that's easier to understand. So that's how the attack looks. We are in a malicious container and we somehow broken up to the guest, maybe using the technique that I've showed earlier. And now from inside the guest, we can create a symlink when we, where we know, in, in the shared directory, where we know the kata runtime will uh, unmount, will try to unmount. And then we, are, we can actually kill the container in order to uh, trigger the kata runtime to, to unmount uh, that path in the shared directory. And now when it does that operation, it actually uh, is redirected uh, to a target of the guest choosing. And that's re a really easy way to create a denial of service on the host because of the, because of the how the kata runtime does the unmount operations. Uh, if we tell it, if we create a symlink that points to uh, the root directory, it will actually unmount all mount points underneath the root directory, making the host very unusual and not able to run any container. So let's see a demo for this attack. So uh, first we'll inspect the mount points on the host, see if the, everything is fine. And then we will run a container that exploits uh, uh, both the container to guest breakout and then the unmount redirection vulnerability. And it will target uh, the root directory in, it attack, in its attack. And once uh, the container is uh, taken down, we can see that uh, those mount points don't contain anything anymore on the host. 
And if we try to do other things like run a container, you can see that the host is really unusable and you can't really uh, use it uh, to do anything. So that's a host denial of service. And that's actually a, a, a very nice uh, moment for us because we got the first effect from the container all the way up to the host and the first sort of a sandbox breakout. And a denial of service is, is nice, right? But we want to gain code execution. So let's look at uh, the mount redirection. You can also redirect uh, not only the unmount operation of the image, but also the mount operation of the image. And that's more interesting because uh, the image as, we've, as I've said, Kata is used to run untrusted images, so the image uh, possibly is malicious. So let's see how that attack will look like. Uh, so we are assuming that the Kata agent now on the guest is malicious. So the Kata runtime will tell it, we're about to create a sandbox, that's the sandbox ID. And now using that message, the Kata agent can know where in the shared directory the Kata runtime is about to bind mount uh, the container image, and it can create a symlink at that path that uh, will actually be followed by the Kata runtime when it tries to bind mount the container image. And now that untrusted, possibly malicious container image can be, will be mounted over a, a path on the host that the, that the guest decides on. So, and there's, those are, there are uh, several mo very interesting paths that uh, the guest could uh, choose, like slash bin or slash, slash lib, which will allow a pretty easy code execution on the host. But the problem with this attack that is that we assumed that the Kata agent is compromised and that the guest is malicious even before the container starts running on the guest, right? Because if, if it's before the container image is bind mounted uh, to the shared directory, then of course that the container isn't uh, running on the guest. So we actually, need, we actually need a way to compromise the guest before the container runs. And we don't have a way to do that right now, right? We only have a way to get, gain code execution on the guest from the container. And that task, so in order to do that, we look at cloud hypervisor and an issue and vulnerability that I found in how Kata uses it. So cloud hypervisor, to remind you, is one of the free virtual, machines monitor, virtual machine monitor options of Kata. And when I try the container to guest a breakout on a Kata with cloud hypervisor, I noticed that uh, Kata stopped working after that and couldn't run any container. And when I inspected the virtual machine image, I saw that the Kata agent uh, binary on that, on the virtual machine image, actually contained garbage data. And that's really concerning because that was the garbage data that I wrote to hard disk on the, uh, from the container. Meaning that from one con from in one guest, any changes that we make to the guest hard disk under cloud hypervisor are propagated to the virtual machine image on the host, meaning that one guest can control the hard disk of all future guests. And because all virtual machine monitors use the same virtual machine image to set up the, the guest, this means that one guest can control every future guest uh, regardless of, of what virtual machine monitor it uses. And that's really bad for multi-tenancy, right? And besides from being a pretty severe issue by itself that one guest can control of all future guests, it's also a way for us uh, to uh, gain code execution on the host because we now can exploit the mount redirection, right? Uh, we needed a way to, for the guest to be compromised even before the container runs. But if we have a way to uh, compromise the, uh, the virtual machine image, me, that means that the guest can be malicious from the moment it boots, right? So we can it can actually create the malicious symlink before the container is started. So uh, if it's uh, still not that clear, let's see how that full attack will look like. So we are now seeing a full container to host code execution. It will require the victim to run our container uh, twice on their uh, system, but that's uh, pretty expe acceptable. Uh, expect that's pretty uh, a pretty normal uh, requirement because most people in automated system, if the first container crashes, it will just try to run it again. So. Let's see how it works. The first, uh, the first time the malicious container is ex executed is executed under cloud hypervisor, and it uh, uses the direct device access vulnerability that we found to change override the Kata agent binary on the hard disk with a malicious version. Now, because we are running under cloud hypervisor, that malicious version is going to be propagated and committed to the virtual machine image, meaning that the next time a, a, a guest will be run, it will run with our uh, malicious uh, Kata agent, right? From the moment it boots. So now that malicious Kata agent on the second container run can exploit the mount redirection issue, create the symlink, 
and uh, redirect our malicious uh, image to whenever on the host we want uh, to gain code execution on the host. So let's see a demo for that attack. So uh, we will be trying to mount the container image over slash bin on the host, and we can see that slash bin is completely normal right now. So we'll run uh, the container under Kata with Cloud Hypervisor, and the first container uh, will replace the Kata agent, uh, the Kata agent binary on the virtual machine image, exploiting uh, uh, the vulnerabilities that we discussed. And now, the next time our malicious uh, container image is executed, it will be running under uh, with under a malicious guest, right? And that malicious guest could uh, exploit the redirection vulnerability that we found to redirect the image uh, over bin. And now, if we want to, uh, if we check out what hap what's happening on bin in the content in the host, we can see that it has a completely different files, and that's actually the files of our malicious container file system. And if we now try to execute something from uh, inside the from a binary that is inside bin, we can now see that the malicious version of that binary is running on the host, and we actually got code execution from the container all the way up to the host. So that's great, right? We, we set up what we wanted to accomplish in the start. We got code execution on the host from inside the container. And really the underlying issues here uh, show how the, the shared directory is really a big attack surface for virtual machines, right? We saw two issues with host, app, with a host applications that interact with the shared directory, right? Uh, the mount and unmount redirection issue uh, that, we that we found that could be exploited uh, uh, and that could be used to trick the Kata runtime. So there could be issues with the host application uh, accessing the shared directory, but there could also be issue with the mechanism itself of the shared directory. Normally there is some process on the host that manages the shared directory, and you can actually find issues with that. Uh, and I found one of those issues that could allow in Kata to uh, launch a denial of service attack, but we won't get into that. I just wanted to, to let you know that the mechanism itself could also be abused. So. What attacks that we saw today? We saw a container to guest uh, breakout using direct device access and exploiting the lack of a, a device C group using a breakout, new breakout technique. And we also saw a guest to host unmount operation, right? We, which we could have used to launch a denial of service attack on the, on the host. We also saw a way for one guest to compromise future guests under cloud hypervisor. And we also found a way for one guest to gain code execution on the host by redirecting the malicious image mount. And I also briefly discussed uh, a denial of service issue that could be found in the shared directory mechanism itself. Now, all of those attacks could be chained together. Uh, all of those vulnerabilities can be chained together to perform a number of attacks uh, on the host. Uh, and I showed some of them today. All of those issues, uh, I've disclosed them to Kata Containers maintainers. They, of course, uh, uh, were fixed. And you can read more at this uh, directory. And Aside from seeing uh, like a cool uh, uh, exploit chain and a sandbox, uh, sandbox uh, uh, breakout, what can we really learn from this research? So first of all, I, want, I hope you now understand that, uh, more about container security and understand that containers are only as secure as their configuration, right? Uh, and a simple way to improve their, their configuration and security is to drop unused privileges. Uh, the breakout that we saw today uh, uh, relied on cap make node, right? Uh, and it's a great example for that because uh, cap make node, most containers have that capability, but almost none of them actually need it, right? An Nginx container doesn't need to create device files and interact with them in any way. So today, we, the point is that today we saw a breakout in Kata container that relies on the make node capability, but tomorrow it's another breakout, right? In a different container runtime that relies on another con capability that your containers have, but they don't use. So the point is, you really should uh, sh remove capabilities and privileges from the container, which it doesn't use. Uh, the second thing you, you need to do is to, if, uh, beside further uh, dropping capabilities, is to uh, further restrict uh, the container using some best practices. And history shows that all of those vulnerabilities that I've talked, all, all of the types of issues that I've talked about in the container escopology part, 
most of them or a lot of them could have been mitigated by simply applying best practices like user namespaces or running the container as, a non as the non-root user. And that those type of things should really be the number one thing you do if you're trying to improve the security of your containers. But we also saw, uh, uh, we also talked about sandboxes today. And sandboxes do limit the attack surface, right? But I want to clarify, there aren't magical solutions that uh, an attackers would find a way to break out. So the point here is don't bet all of your chips on, a, on one bag, right? Don't only rely on the sandbox. Uh, you should really uh, uh, be prepared for that sandbox to be broken up broken out of. It should be an enhancement and not a replacement of your current security features. And the final thing that if you do decide to use a sandbox, you should get, you should really get the full potential out, out of it and enable its security features. Kata, for example, has some security features that aren't enabled by default that could have been useful uh, to mitigate one of the attacks that we saw here today. So that's really a, a all I have for you today, I hope that you enjoyed it, that you learn about uh, container security a bit, and I'll be happy to take any questions.